can do what he's promised to do is will prophesy to somebody and tell them now faith is hello and welcome to another now faith program we're so glad that you've taken time to be with us today and i want to tell you we've got something really special for you this year, the founders of the Durban Christian Center, Pastors Fred and Nellie Roberts, are celebrating 60 years in full-time ministry. And in addition, they are celebrating 60 years of marriage. Wow, that's a long time. But you know, they served for 25 years in a major Pentecostal denomination before setting out in 1979 to pioneer the Durban Christian Center. And now, 35 years later, the Jesus Dome overlooking the city has become a powerful witness to the people in the city of Durban. Here now is my interview with them about those early years. What I wanted to ask you right now um, is, is the pioneering aspect. You're an, an apostle because of the fact that you, you know how to start churches and from nothing you can start a church. But what was the first church that you pioneered? The very first church, Pastor John, was when we went to Zambia. Nelly and I got married on the 13th of November, 1954. And uh, just after we got married, we set off to Zambia without promise of money, just going to start a church in Livingston, in Livingston, close to Victoria Falls. Now, what was it, what did, what did God say? Why Livingston, why Zambia? Well, it wasn't uh, so much what God told me. Yes. It's what the authorities tell you. Oh, I see, because you were in the I was part of an organization. Okay. And uh, with this passion for souls, yes. get them saved, win souls at any cost. And uh, this opportunity arose in Livingston. Yes. But how that came about was that we went to Bulawayo when my brother-in-law, who was a medical doctor, was practicing. Yes. And stayed with them just for a couple of days. And I ministered in the Assemblies of God Church in uh, Bulawayo. And then this opportunity arose to go up to Zambia to start a church. I said, well, I'm in for it. We're going to start a church, pioneer it with my darling wife, with not a promise of a salary, nothing. And I can never understand how these young people want to go and work for God. And they might have a passion for souls, but they're looking for somebody to provide the finances for them. Yeah. But we just felt we Stepped wanted to work for faith. God, step out in faith, and uh, went up to Zambia, to Bulawayo, uh, from Bulawayo up to Zambia, and uh, to Pioneer Church. There were no members, nothing. There was just a couple of people who were interested in the church. And they said, you can come and stay with us, which we did. And uh, you start ministering to people wherever you can. Yes. Personal evangelism and so on. Wow. And then uh, you get people saved, you need to get baptized. Get baptized. Because I've always advocated that when you get saved, yes. you must get baptized. Absolutely. As soon as you give your heart to the Lord, the next step is water baptism. Yes. That was the very first sermon preached in the church yes. when it started. Yes. Repent, Peter said, and, and be, be baptized. baptized. So we baptized people in the, in the river. And the only river was the Zambezi River, sure. infested with crocodiles. And uh, go down there, I never, never forget going down to baptize people. And all these folks, you know, your few church members that you have that are becoming become members of the church now come to watch and uh, got these folks who are going to get baptized and and uh, I said well what about the crocodiles they said don't worry we'll, we'll see that they 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 driven off you don't have to bother with that and so <laughs> we, luckily we didn't baptize many people who's baptized now yeah you know running into hundreds <laughs> at that time just, just a few baptize one and out <laughs> as quick as you can you baptize to get the water for the, for the water to come out and of course, uh, yes. it was exciting right. to pioneer a church like that. Yes. And uh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's how you started. And you were there obviously for a few months or so. Yeah. And then from there, 
tell us about the whole story about Escort because that's interesting as well and, and how God worked a miracle in that whole event. We left uh, Livingston, Livingston yes. to go to Escort because the superintendent of the district um, said there's 25 people come and start a church with, with 25, 25 people, people in escort, which is in the Midlands, no church, right. no, no church, church there, no building, nothing, just go and start a church. So um, we set off to go there, and again, of course, we no promise of anything, and. Uh, looking for the 25 people when he got there, we couldn't find them. Because there was only one. Oh, only one person. Only one person who was interested in the church. And the Zulu people called him Malala Bapaipin, which means somebody, right, he's a tramp. And then I looked lives at him and I said, I'm starting a church with somebody who <laughs> looks like a tramp, you know. Sure. He um, looked like a tramp. Yeah. Looked like a tramp. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, just, I don't even say, I don't even know whether we hired the hall or what. Was he saved, know. Pastor Fred? He was saved. He was saved, he but was he looked saved, like a tramp. But, uh, yeah. He, you know. But you know. He needed needed some. He needs to be sanctified. Sanctification. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, we we hired a little little hall there, and you had to clean out the beer bottles before you could have a a meeting. You know, for the night before they had yes. a time of drinking and whatever. And then we'd have service. It was an old moth hall. Yeah, it was an old moth hall. And then uh, Nelly's brother gave us a car. First car we ever had given to us in the ministry. It was an old 36 Willys. <laughs> Most people won't even know what that looks like. But I don't. <laughs> it, it had no shock absorbers. Oh boy. And it rocked like anything. And Wendy was just a little baby, just. We go out to visit on the farm, and by the time we got there, she'd vomited over us and uh, smelling all of baby vo vomit, going to visit, going to uh, visit people, visit uh, the farmers. Because it's mostly farm, it's a farm area. Okay. And um, you know, to to build it, to get a church going, a few people. You know, I said, Lord, uh, we need a building because if you've got a building, you've got somewhere to gather people in. Yes, yeah. I need to be out there at eight o'clock in the morning to go and look, look for people to be. Yeah. So he would go knock door to door, door to door, and, and visiting people, people to come to. Because that's how you build churches, just by visitation. By knocking on doors, doors and, and asking people, yes. do you have any children here who don't go to Sunday school? Yeah. Would you like them to come to Sunday school? Sure. So I'll come pick them up. And so I rode that old Willie's to pieces virtually until I got another car and rode that thing to, to the ground, picking children up, bringing them, having Sunday school. Now I take the Sunday school, I lead them in singing and all the rest of it, and then take them home and bring the parents who want to come to church. So slowly, within a year, we had 100, 100 confirmed members of the church. Yeah. And we used to baptize them there. As you go into Escort, there's a river. Yes, yes. And we used to baptize them in the river, and then the whole town would come out. Virtually. Virtually, come because come it was a Dutch Reform area in those okay. days. Very those strong Dutch days. Reform. So, because they said that we were like crocodiles, you know, or they're pulling people into the water, you know. So they all used to come and clap like anything, you know, when we used to, when Fred used to be baptizing the people, you know. Well, it's interesting when you baptize people in a river and they come up all soaking wet, covered in mud sometimes. Yes. It, it's, uh, it was But it wonderful. was exciting, John, to yeah. see people with life changed, Wonderful. You know? Exciting. And I remember, you know, going to the post office, I'd walk for exercise in the morning, walk up to the post office and, uh, when you, when you go to Escort, and you go through Escort, there's, a, there's an Anglican church on the right-hand side as you pass, pass through. And it's a beautiful little stone building. And uh, I remember many times I'd say, Lord, just a building like that. Just a building like that, Lord, we can just, if we could have a building, like, to see 200 people, just, yes, just to have yes. a building like that to gather the people in. Because yeah. he always believed that you must have your own home. Like yes, a yes. father has their own home for right. his family, then Jesus' church must have so, their own home for their family. You must have a home for the people. Right. Where they you know, recognize this. Not, the church is not the building, we know that. Yes. But you must have a, a place where they can gather together in. Yes. So it's security. Right. It's like I tell young preachers to get your own home. It's important. Don't, 
don't uh, hire a place, mm. you never own a home, mm. own it. Mm. And you need to establish a footprint yes. in that town, right. wherever you are. And you do so by owning that piece by of land piece and, of and of land. building on that land. You know, yes. you, you, you believe for it in the spirit yes. and then you believe for it on, on land. Yes. So one day the Lord says to me, uh, I said, Lord, you know, I'd like to. He said, well, who's the richest man escort? I said, I don't know. The Lord was asking you this yeah, now. Who's the richest yeah. man escort? Because if you're going to get something, you must get it from somebody who has something. Right. So um, uh, I found out that it was a man by the name of Jocelyn Cook. So I decided to go and see him and ask him for a piece of land or property to build a church on. Yes. So when I got to his house... Now you didn't know him from a bar of sale. I didn't oh, know him no. from a bar of sale. I went and introduced myself and, and saw him and... He was ill in bed, and um, I went into, his, into the bedroom and uh, introducing myself, spoke to him. And then finally, after some time, I asked if I could pray for him. You know, I, I was too intimidated by this exceptionally wealthy man to ask him for a piece of land to build a church on. So uh, I just said, can I pray for you? And I prayed for him. He was very grateful and I left. And so uh, I couldn't shake it off of me. I went back again to see him. The same day? No. The next day? The next day I went back to see him. Might have been a couple of days later. And I asked him afterward, after talking to him for a while, if he has some land he can let me have to build a church, church. on. So he said, son, you know, you must remember I was in my early 20s. Yes. He said, son, uh, I'll see what I, I've got to let you have. So I interpreted that to mean that he's going to give me land because I'm going to get it for nothing. I'm going to pay for it. Yeah. I'm saying, God, I thank you for that land. And every day when I walk past that little church, I said, thank you, Lord, for a building and thank you for land. Believe you for it. And I kept verbalizing it. I was exercising faith, faith. and faith... Uh, I, didn't spoken. I didn't understand faith like okay. I do today yeah. or over the years. But... Uh, he, he said, I'll, I, I'll see what I have to, uh, I've got to let you have. So when I got back to see him again, now I'm going to get the land. You know, I was all excited. So he said, uh, you know, uh, I've given away a lot in my lifetime. Given it away to this project and that project and to churches. And he, he said, uh, uh, I've got three acres of land that you can have down near the river. And uh, he quoted the amount of money. And in those days, you know, thousands, it's like millions today. It's like English pounds. Yeah, it was pounds. Mm. So uh, I said, but I thought you were going to give me that. He said, no, 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 no. He got quite upset. And he virtually you know, chased me out of his house. But I said, well, before I go, let me pray for you. And so I, I knelt down next to his bed and prayed for him. And uh, so, uh, you know, I still couldn't shake it off. You know, you think, Man, that's, you've taken a beating, forget about it. Yeah. If you, you won't give you anything. He's that kind of person. And I've discovered, you know, that you need to be bold. Faith is bold. You've got to bold. be bold in faith when you sense that it's God talking to you. And uh, ask that your joy may be full. So I went back and I, when I walked in the room, he said, young man, I'm glad to see you. He said, I've got 10 acres I want to give you. Sure, 10 acres from ten three, acres to give it you. went up to, th to 10. Yeah, it started off with three, three that he was going to sell me, yeah. but now he's going to give me 10 acres. So I was very excited about it. He says, don't just stand there. Justin Cook's word is his word. Uh, so he called the real estate guy, he came up and um, signed over 10 acres. And so, I didn't know where it was until I went and walked on it. <laughs> we walked on the property and I thought to myself, my word, 10 acres, look how big it is. I only asked for one. I only needed one acre. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to build you a church. You asked for one and God gave you 10. Yeah, I'm going to ask, you know, 10 acres, I'm going to have a, a build a, a church to seat to 200 people. Just a little building, you know, that's where you... That's how small our faith, our faith was. It's a small town and... You know, only 2,000 
uh, population. That's not counting all the Zulus and others. So uh, uh, this huge piece of land. So the man who took my place in that in that town, the church denomination sent a man there who they voted for, and they voted him in as the pastor, because now I'd taken it to a point where they had at least a hundred people, and um, a fair, fair state of finances, and uh, so they, they called a man to come and take my place when I left. Because you went to Malvern. And I came down to the city of Durban to yes. the suburb, to the suburb of Malvern. Yes, yes. Where uh, an elder who was in our church years years prior to that had built a building, yeah. uh, bought a piece of land, and they built this building and yes. came there. But uh, when I yes, when yeah, I yes, looked at, at es Escort, now 10 acres, the pastor took my place. He sold the piece of land, or not all of it, he sold nine acres. Wow. Sold nine acres, what are we going to do with 10 acres? You know, one acre is enough to build a church and even a manse mm. or a parsonage. So uh, he, uh, he sold nine acres mm. and the, the money that they realized, yes. they built a church to seat 200 people with the pews and everything necessary for yes. a church Amen. to progress and a little manse yes. or a parsonage next door to the church. Mm. And uh, what... Uh, what happened was that uh, a man comes to escort to Pioneer Charismatic Years Church. Later. Years later. His name is Dermot Sandals. Okay. And uh, he comes to see me because we'd started a non denominational church called Christian Center. So he said, Do you mind, or asked me, Do you mind if I call our church Christian Center? I said, Not at all. I'll I can't hold, hold you to something. He said, no, uh, I'd like to do that. Call it Midlands Christian Center. So I said, well, please yourself. So he invites me to come up to escort in the town hall and have a crusade. So we, uh, it, the town hall is packed people. I don't know, you know, somehow he managed to draw all those people. Well, it's not a very big town hall, but it was packed down. So in that, in that meeting, second night I think it was, I mentioned this story that I've told you about yes. the land. And the man who bought the land nine was in that building, in that building who bought the nine acres. Okay. And he came to Dermot and myself afterwards, he said, you know, I've got no right to that land. He said, you know, I've tried to sell it for development a couple of times and every time I try and sign the document, I shake so much I can't sign. Wow. He said, it must wow. belong to God. So I, I, I I can't keep it. And I want you, Pastor Dermot, to have it if you want it. Gosh. So he gave him the nine acres, signed it gave over. Gave it back to him. He gave it back to him. And also he's, he said, I'll supply all the material, building material, and I'll help you to build the building. Wow. Thank you so much, Pastor Fred and Nell. That's an amazing story and testimony of what God can do for those who are just simply faithful, faithful, to His calling, faithful to His Word, faithful to what God tells us to do. And I want to tell you that there are a lot more exciting stories of their 60 years in ministry that we will air for you in the future. And now we've got an exciting message that we have retrieved from our archives and it's Pastor Fred preaching an incredible message. I know you will be blessed. There were many who were asking who Jesus really was. And when Jesus put this very pointed question to his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, whom do you say that I am? The opinions of many differ. But what is your personal opinion about me? And he said, well, some say that you are Elijah. Others say you are Jeremiah. Some say that you are John the Baptist. It's true that in his preaching he was like John the Baptist. It's true in his compassion he was like Jeremiah the weeping prophet. It's true that in his prayer life he was like Elijah. Thank God that you and I tonight have been called into fellowship with him and we are in his church. His church was established by him 
and is being built by him. I would never be so presumptuous as to think that I could build his church. He is building his church. And perhaps when you look at the beginning of the church, it seems so infinitesimal. There's not much really as far as the church is concerned. Twelve men that Jesus pours his life into and then he commissions them. But the church begins to take off and it grows and they are multiplied to the church. Daily they add it to the church and the church abounds in love and grace and the power and the glory of God is upon the infant church. And the early church turned the then world upside down within a short period of approximately 300 years. They did not have church buildings. They did not have PA equipment. They did not have television. They did not have radio, but they had the power of God. And in and through the power of God, they pulled down the strongholds of the devil and they did exploits in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is not just fading out. Somebody says, but don't you know, preacher, that in the last days, we've got to hold on to the bitter end. And don't you know that the love of many will wax cold? And the picture that's presented by many servants of God is that the church is waxing weak and it's, going, it's insipid and it's powerless. But let me tell you, the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well on the earth. The church of the living God is not going to go out of this world and all wisdom the peg. It's going out of this world a glorious church. The church of the living God are born again believers. The blood of Jesus Christ. That's his true church. The ecclesia, the called out ones called out of sin, called out of bondage and servitude to Satan into fellowship with God's dear son, who know in their hearts that they are born again, who know that they are established in present truth in the faith, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wow, wasn't that inspiring? I just love it when Pastor Fred preaches about the church and the fact is that Jesus said he would build his church and the very gates of hell would not prevail against it. Thank you so much, Pastor Fred. And now just before we close this broadcast today, I'd like to give those of you an opportunity. You've been listening to this Now Faith program. You've heard to the testimonies of Pastor Fred and Nell, and you've heard Pastor Fred preach a sermon. But as you've been listening, your life is not right with God. You're away from God. You have no peace with God. And today, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know about today that there is an opportunity for you today to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, and I know you're there, then I want you to pray this simple prayer with me right now. Would you say after me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name, just as I am with all of my faults, all of my failures, and all of my sin. And I ask you for forgiveness. I repent today, Lord. And as I do, I turn my back on sin. I renounce the devil and all of his works but you, Lord Jesus, with my heart I believe and with my mouth I confess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thank you for your blood that cleanses me and washes me. I receive eternal life and the forgiveness of all of my sins and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I'm so glad that you prayed that prayer, friend. And we would so love to hear from you, even if it's just a prayer request that you have. But just to tell us what the Lord has done, please, right now, there's details coming, the bottom of your screen. Would you be so kind as to email us and tell us what the Lord 
has done for you. Until next time, remember, now faith is. God bless you. We start learning before we take our first breath. And our learning deepens as we discover what our hearts beat for and what our hearts break for. These are insights of love. Because to love profoundly and intentionally is the highest form of learning and should be as natural as breathing. But it is when our learning has the breath of the Holy Spirit that we can break through into our true potential. It is in a learning environment saturated with His presence that we can begin to realize and accomplish what we were born for. Durban Christian Center's Bible Institute prioritizes this kind of learning. That's why we call it the School of the Spirit. A school where the ordinary becomes the extraordinary.